Hello everyone, I am Ritwik, the research associate at BMSIS, like you people. So I am currently studying at ISO Mohali in India and I am doing my master's thesis project uh, at Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research, Germany. Today I will talk about the, the project that I have been working on uh, for the past few months. So it is intrinsically disordered proteins and their role in phase separation. So basically I will talk about the interplay of, interplay of charge and valency on phase separation, both modern as well as primitive aspects. So what are IDPs or intrinsically disordered proteins and why are we studying them? So intrinsically disordered proteins are polypeptides that possess high proportion of charged amino acids and they possess significantly low proportion of hydrophobic amino acids. Almost 30% of eukaryote protein is composed of intrinsically disordered region and more than 70% of signaling proteins possess disordered regions. So you can have an uh, idea what is their significance in eukaryotes. Now in a protein chain, uh, the disordered region is more abundant in the tail region of the protein and it is less abundant in the middle of the protein. And last but not the least, the intrinsically disordered proteins are crucial for a phenomenon known as phase separation, which I will discuss ahead. Now it has been observed that IDPs or intrinsically disordered proteins were not much studied until very recently. It was in the late 2000s that people started developing interest in IDPs. And right now, most of the protein labs uh, are working on these specific regions. But let's quickly uh, discuss some of the important functions. So IDPs play an important role in conversion of trypsinogen to trypsin, fibrinogen to fibrin. Calcineurin, uh, in calcineurin, it actually acts as a switch by uh, helping in the turning on and turning off mechanism. So if anybody, if anybody is interested in the literature that I am, or, all the, or any sort of information that I have used in my PPD today, he can contact me, I will send him the literature. Okay, so now moving on to the next slide. So what is phase separation of proteins? As you can understand from the name itself, so phase separation means separation of two phases or entities when they are present in the same system. The classical example used to describe phase separation is separation of oil droplets when oil is added to water. In terms of biology, phase separation is presence of membraneless organelles in a bound state uh, in which, which is they exist as a compact droplets even in the absence of a membrane. So nucleolus was the very first organelle to be uh, discovered and it was followed by various other organelles such as Kajal bodies, stress granules, pea bodies, germ granules, etc. The figure on the right covers all these membraneless organelles that are present inside a cell. Apart from that, these membraneless organelles or these phase separated organelles play an important role in diseases also. For example, uh, Parkinson uh, and other neurological disorders have been, uh, it has been studied that phase separation and amyloid formation plays a crucial role in progression of these diseases. So, uh, our question of interest, these are our questions that I will basically be discussing today. So how valency affects phase separation of proteins? What role does concentration of proteins play in phase separation? Were these sequences present in the early earth? And if so, how did they originate and what function did they play? So coming to our first question, which is role of valency and amino acid sequence in phase behavior. So valency plays a crucial role in determining phase behavior. At the molecular level, temporary interactions between multivalent domain molecules or intrinsically disordered regions are the key reason for phase separation. So we can use the sticker and spacer analogy to describe how it works. So if you look at the figure towards your right, you can clearly see the stickers are, these are the stickers and they are interlinked by spacers. So these stickers act like hotspots and they interact with other proteins via electrostatic, hydrophobic and few other interactions. A detailed illustration is provided in the coming slide. 
So the, this illustration describes how two proteins named SH3 and PRM interact with each other. Their interaction cross links will have finite time span uh, and this time span is based on the interaction between these two proteins, the strength, the range, directionality. So it has been observed that if the same concentration of SH3 and PRM are mixed at equimolar levels and then their concentration are gradually increased at an identical rate, everything which is present in the system, it starts forming a network. So they gradually form a network and so the and moreover if we increase the valency of SH3 and PRM the network and or the cross-linking behavior also starts increasing that is the time of formation of these networks starts decreasing so in the next slide you will clearly see what I am trying to explain so if we consider these two factors valency and concentration collectively you will observe the phase separation as well as droplet formation now I will talk about how phase separation and droplet formation are collectively related to each other. So when SH3 and PRM are mixed at equimolar concentration and their concentrations are increased gradually at an, at an identical rate, everything in the system starts forming a network as I described previ previously. So this concentration at which things in the system start forming a network, this concentration is known as percolation concentration, also known as percolation threshold. And the important aspect about this threshold concentration is that, is that it affects phase separation of proteins and also the droplet formation. So now I will talk about these three conditions that determine the overall phase behavior. So uh, when the percolation, uh, so let's consider the first case which is percolation or droplet formation without phase separation. So when the C dilute is greater than C percolation. It means that when the concentration of the dilute phase is greater than the uh, percolation concentration, you will observe droplet formation, but there is no phase separation. Now coming to the next factor, which is phase separation without percolation, which means the entirely opposite of above. So when the percolation threshold is greater than the concentration of the dense phase we will observe phase separation without percolation now we now this is the most important condition and the entire field of phase separation is based upon this condition which is phase separation as well as droplet formation so when our when our concentration is at the percolation threshold that is it lies between the dense phase as well as the dilute phase we observe phase separation and phase separation is followed by droplet formation. So phase separation you can clearly see that these two phases dense phase and dilute phase they are separated. So this is phase separation and when they reach the percolation threshold these two concentrations will lead to formation of small droplets and these droplets are formed due to interaction between these networks. So I have uh, illustrated it using the SH3 and PRM domains. So they interact with each other and start forming networks, which we observe in the form of small droplets. Now, how can we relate this study to the early earth? So whether they were present on the early earth or not, and if they were present, what role did they play? So everyone who is interested in origin of life or life during early earth must know about RNA world or RNA as the very first biological entity to exist, but RNA alone cannot maintain a stable fold and it requires a framework for its stability. So intrinsically disordered proteins are loose and floppy when they exist alone, but when they are in contact with other molecules, they are, they are quite high chances that these molecules uh, interact with other molecules and provide them stability. So it is hypothesized in many papers that these uh, intrinsically disordered regions came into the contact of RNA particles that were present in the early earth and they provide a stable framework to these RNA, RNA bodies. Moreover, another example is that the ribosome also comprises of RNA and these ribosomes interact with positively charged polypeptides 
as these positively charged polypeptides are important for the creation of these ribosomes. So, yeah, there is very high possibility that these intrinsically disordered regions uh, might have been present on the early Earth and they supported, or I should say, and they provided a proper framework for stability of RNA. Now, how did these peptides uh, reach the early Earth? So, uh, coming to this question, like how did these peptides reach the early Earth? So, condensation of carbon atoms on the surface of cold solid particles, which you can consider as a cosmic dust, can form isomeric glycine monomers, which are also referred to as aminocutin molecules. So, these molecules can then polymerize to form homopolymeric peptides of different lengths. Now, since as we talked earlier that RNA needs a framework to remain stable, these IDPs might have interacted with RNA and provided them a stable configuration as I described earlier. Now, interaction among carbon, carbon monoxide and uh, this is carbon, carbon monoxide and nihonium. Uh, this is the nihonium which is denoted by NH, this is ammonia. So, interaction between these compounds uh, leads to the formation of aminoketine which polymerizes to form peptides. Now these peptides are found on the surface of meteors and meteoroids and taking into account the theory of pans panspermia, it could be possible that the intrinsically disordered peptides might have arrived the early earth via these uh, meteors and meteorites. So this is the theory of panspermia that the that these IDPs arrived the early earth uh, from uh, the early earth using these meteors and meteorites they reached the surface of the earth interacted with the RNA and led to stability of RNA and gradually this RNA evolved into other biological molecules or biological entities. So coming to the next slide I would like to thank Dr. Tony as he is our project mentor he helped a lot us a lot of us uh, throughout the presentation moreover i would like to thank dr graham for all the support for maintaining the program very smoothly and conducting all the activities uh, moreover i would like to thank all the people in my team so these are my ysp fellows thanks to them for their moral support and in case if anybody has any question, he or she can email me at this, this is my email ID. Thank you. Moreover, if you have any sort of doubt regarding literature, uh, kindly let me know. I can send you the papers as well. Thank you everyone for your time and patience.